This is a case where we're going to try out some Bruxer anterior crowns. As you can probably tell, there's three uh, old PFM crowns uh, that are in place. And you can see that they're not very aesthetic crowns. In fact, the incisal third. In fact, the eight and nine look like they were done by a dental technician student or a dentist on maybe their first day in dental school. Tooth number seven looks a little better, but you can see we've got some massive uh, black triangles there. And uh, those are going to be a little difficult to close because when you've lost um, papilla height like that, it gets very difficult to close them without creating uh, a shelf of zirconia. This case was done by my associate, Dr. Murison, and it's a great example of how far we've come as a laboratory with Bruxer anterior. Now, obviously, it's not too difficult when you're starting off with some really ugly PFMs like this, but I think this case will illustrate just how aesthetic Bruxer anterior has become. So we're going to anesthetize the patient. That's the razor carbide burr from Axis Dental being used to cut through a PFM. By the way, most of the crowns that I've taken off recently have been Bruxer crowns or Emacs crowns. And I swear this feels like I'm on vacation when I get to cut off a PFM these days. I actually do it slow and leisurely and take my time because it's so simple compared to cutting through zirconia or lithium disilicate that uh, it's really almost fun. It's, it's like a trip down memory lane. I almost feel like I've pulled out my high school yearbook uh, if I didn't have such painful high school memories, but it's almost like a trip down memory lane going, I'll oh, remember the good old days as we cut through these because that one razor carbide burr will go through the ceramic material and the metal like a knife through butter and uh, very easy just to put a crown remover in there, spread the PFM and take it off. So again, it feels kind of like the, the good old days and I kind of feel sorry for the uh, dentists, the young dentists growing up today, because most of what they're going to take off is going to be monolithic restorations. They're now 87% of what we do here at the lab of the crowns and bridges we do are solid zirconia and lithium disilicate. And so the dentists of tomorrow have a lot of those tough restorations to take off. So we're placing a double zero cord here. I just want to move the tissue back a little to help me gauge where my margin position is going to be. I have a pretty hard and fast rule about not taking an impression uh, the same day I prep when I'm prepping multiple anterior crowns. And really because it's, I want to see how the tissue is going to react to the biotemps. And I want to make sure that, uh, well, typically that we don't blunt any papilla. Unfortunately, we don't have many uh, papilla here to even blunt, but I'm putting the cord in any rate to get about a half to two thirds of a millimeter of retraction. And then I'm using my 856 uh, 018 burr to go in here and just kind of smooth around the margin, clean up all this discoloration at the old margin of where the PFM was. Um, you can see there's actually a decent margin on that tooth. You know, typically you see a lot of feather edge margins uh, on PFMs, but there we've actually got a pretty well developed deep chamfer or shallow shoulder, whatever you want to call it. So that's going to work just fine for um, Bruxer anterior. In fact, that would be enough of a margin for uh, an Emax uh, crown as well. So it's kind of what I call a universal margin. I like margins that uh, will work for almost any type of restoration. As I love to do with my Cavo Electrotor can piece, I'm going to turn it down to 2000 uh, RPMs and, and then go along and just kind of smooth off the margins with a fine burr. See that red stripe? That's an 856018F, F meaning that it's fine grit. And you can see that because of that uh, red stripe. You can see there was a recent endo done um, and endo access on the lingual of that tooth. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. In fact, tooth number eight actually definitely seems like the shade has a much lower value uh, compared to tooth number nine. So um, we're going to fit the biotemps right now, get them all trimmed up and put them on. And then we're actually going to do a little walking bleach technique with uh, this patient. Uh, we'd like to get that uh, value of that prep a little bit lighter so it comes a little closer to matching. Um, tooth number nine, you can reline biotemps with either a bisacryl material or methylmethacrylate or ethyl methacrylate. It's, it's really up to you. The bisacryl materials will not chemically bond um, to the biotemps themselves, but sometimes there's enough mechanical retention in the biotemps that uh, they will in fact stick in place. And I, I think we'd all agree that it's much easier to work with a bisacryl material than it is with a methyl or ethyl methacrylate, and it certainly stinks less for the patient. 
And with most of the ones like that was Luxatemp Solar that we're using from DMG. And Luxatemp Solar is a nice bisacryl material that will get to a putty stage in the self-cure mode. And then when you've trimmed most of it and you're ready to set it up nice and hard, then you can light, cure it with the light. So that's Luxatemp Solar. It's from the same Luxatemp family of products. It just happens to be the Luxatemp that I really like for relighting biotemps because it kind of has an infinite set. In other words, it sets up to a putty stage, but it won't set completely until you cure it with the light. And when you're relining indirect provisionals like biotemps, that's a nice feature to have. Otherwise, with a bisacryl, like regular Luxatemp Ultra, once you put it into the biotemps and seat it on the preps, it's going to set and set relatively quick. I mean, it might have a long working time, but it goes from unset to set very quickly. And so if you have any undercuts or your preps don't completely draw with each other, you can lock that biotemps bridge in place with a bisacryl material. So the Lexatemp Solar lets you, you know, move it, pump it up and down, or at least be able to remove it from preps that don't draw. And then you can light cure it to make sure that, um, that you do, in fact, uh, have it set up all the way. But it kind of cures on demand, in other words. So we're going to put that on with some temp bond and clean up that temporary cement. And usually one of the things we're looking for is to make sure we don't blunt any papillas. In fact, we want to see black triangles while the bio temps are in place because we want the patient to be able to rinse with tooth and gums tonic from Dental Herb Company, which is my, my favorite way to uh, keep tissue healthy. Tissue's looking pretty good two weeks later, so we're going to impress today after we clean up the preps. And you can see that uh, the walking bleach looks like it's worked pretty well on tooth number eight, at least in the incisal, you know, maybe two thirds. And tooth number nine uh, looks to be, um, you know, still a little dark, but it hasn't been endodontically treated. So we're going to go ahead and do the uh, fill the endo access on um, the back of this with a little lighter shade composite to try to get hopefully a higher value. And um, as you see, tooth number nine, you know, the, the lighting here does make it look, I think, darker than uh, darker than it actually is. It's not quite that dark. And one of the reasons we're concerned with this and why we're trying to lighten up um, tooth number eight. And, you know, if tooth number nine were endodontically treated, honestly, we'd be in there doing the same thing. Is because with Bruxer anterior, you we really have raised the translucency to the point where you can actually see dark uh, stump shades or prep shades showing through the crowns, just like you can with Emacs, especially the HT, high translucency Emacs, and the MT, the medium translucency. And so one of the issues is with both these materials that a really dark prep shade can show through the restorations. And so there's been times where a doctor has prescribed uh, Bruxer anterior for anterior crowns, and the teeth were endodontically treated, and so the preparation's actually showing through. I guess you could call it the downside of having a high translucency material. And, you know, unless the doctor can go in and somehow change the shade of the prep like we're doing here, um, sometimes we'll have to change them over to regular Bruxer material. It's not as aesthetic as Bruxer anterior or Emacs, but it will block out more um, discoloration. And so sometimes, you know, you don't know until you order the crowns, but that's why providing a prep shade or a stump shade is always a nice idea. We like the um, Ivoclar shade guide, the one that says natural dye material on it with the ST shades. You'll see one of those shade tabs uh, coming up soon here. And those are good because Ivoclar sells dye material that uh, completely matches that natural dye material shade tab. And as a result, we're able to make dyes out of that dye material and then try the Bruxer anterior crowns onto that dye material and see whether or not, you know, at the dimension that we've milled it at, maybe it's six tenths of a millimeter thick, maybe it's eight tenths or a millimeter, we can put it onto that dye material and see whether or not it's going to show through and whether or not it's going to affect the final aesthetic result of the crowns and that way we can uh, call you and say you know well we won't we won't call you if it looks good but if there's an issue with something showing through and it's typically in the gingival third we can call you and say hey this is showing through here's our here's our choices you know and the choice is usually going to be to go to a less translucent material so here's the double zero cord going back um, into place since we are in fact going to impress this today and you can see that uh, tooth number nine, the prep shade on that does not look um, awful when we get the light a little closer. I think I might have been blocking the light a little bit before when it looked so dark. 
and tooth number eight actually looks good as well. So we're going to put that double zero cord uh, all around this tissue. And then usually on these darker teeth, I'm going to drop the margin just a little bit more. Again, at 2000 RPMs uh, with the water off so we don't create um, too much heat. I can see that uh, I'm being very careful here to try not to touch this tooth too much in the incisal one half because I can already see that we're getting a little close to the pulp there. And um, this is one of the balancing acts in aesthetic dentistry is prepping enough on that facial third of the incisal edge to make sure we don't have bucky beaver teeth, um, but at the same time trying not to encroach onto that uh, pulpal space. But for now, it actually looks um, pretty good. So I'm going to put that number two cord uh, on top of that double zero cord. And again, for me, this is the gold standard anytime that we're going to uh, want to get the best impression possible. Um, I just find that doing it with uh, the two core technique is the way to do it. I'm perfectly happy to use a diode laser in the posterior. I have a Picasso light from AMD lasers and I find it really works well in the posterior, but to use any kind of diode laser on anterior teeth like this, I lose, I tend to lose tissue height when I go into kind of trough around the tooth to make room for the impression material. These are three anatomic copper caps uh, that are being used here as the patient bite down, bites down on these. And again, these accomplish uh, a couple purposes. Um, it helps hold the cord down into place so the patient can't play with it with their tongue. And it also provides great uh, hemostasis as the patient bites down onto it. It puts pressure on the tissue and thus the surrounding capillary beds. We will often take those copper caps and moisten them before we put them in the place because we don't want to over dry um, the teeth, especially if they're vital. And we do have some vital teeth there. So top cord comes out, number two cord. You can see the type of retraction that you get here even before the impression material uh, gets squirted onto the preparations themselves. You just can't get that with non-cord methods of retraction. And it's it's difficult to get that in the anterior with a diode laser and not lose um, vertical tissue height. So for me, two cord in the anterior is still the gold standard. Is it fun? Eh, not particularly. Is it uh, the easiest way? No, certainly not. But it does get the best results. And really what I found for me and what's legal in California is I put the first cord in that double zero cord because I'm usually there prepping the tooth at the same time. And then my assistant can put the double zero cord in. I mean, I'm sorry, the number two cord in at the end uh, as we're getting ready to take the impression and put the copper caps on. So I put the double zero cord in while I'm prepping and my assistant will put the number two cord in and then put the copper caps on and I'll come back in eight to 10 minutes to take the impression. So yes, the two cord technique is a pain. But the good news is, at least in California and, and many other states, you only have to put one of the cords in, doctor. There's the ST1 from the Stump Shade Guide or the Natural Dye Material Shade Guide from Ivoclar. And there's a 1M1 shade tab being held to the adjacent cuspid over there. This patient has also done some vital bleaching. Otherwise, you'd never see a 1M1 uh, cuspid. So patient's back and it's time to try in the crowns. So you can see we've got some uh, black triangles there and I'm going to have my technician Cindy add a little, you know, a little more material possibly. Uh, but for the most part, um, we're not going to add anything. These are going to be monolithic brooks or anterior restorations. And if you tried to close that black triangle there by adding, you know, some low fusing ceramic, you would get some 90 degree angles where plaque would want to get stuck. So most of the time, you know, the amount of closure you're going to get on a black triangle is determined by how far subgingival you go with your margin, your restorative margin. The farther subgingival you go, the more room you give your technician to close that black triangle. But then you're also, you know, running the risk of creating a biologic with violation at the same time. You can see we have uh, getting close, getting deep there on tooth number nine. We can see that uh, pulp showing pretty clearly through the dentin. So this is G5. This is a combination of 35% HEMA, 5% glutaraldehyde from Clinician's Choice. And this is going to um, stop just about any chance of postoperative sensitivity. We're going to put this on, wait one minute, and then suction it off with a high volume suction or blow just a little bit with an ADEC warm tooth dryer so we don't blow it onto the tissue. And then put a second coat and leave it on for a minute again. And this is going to fix that tissue so that we don't get sensitivity and kill 99.9% .9 of the bacteria 
that might happen to be living on those preps. We're seeding the anterior bruxer. This is multi-link auto mix from Ivaclar Vivident. This is a self-etching resin cement. And that means that there's a separate self-etching uh, A and B that you have to mix together. And then you take that primer, paint it onto the tooth, wait uh, 20 to 30 seconds and evaporate it. Um, as opposed to something like Reliax Unisem or Maxem Elite, where those self-etching primers are in the cement themselves. And by doing that extra step, by mixing the A and B primer, painting it on the teeth, and then mixing the cement and putting it on, you get about a 20-25% increase in bond strength. And to me, that's very easy to do and worth doing. And so since the Multi-Link Auto Mix is a dual cure cement, we kind of call this tack and wave, just kind of you know, waving it back and forth as it uh, goes into place. It really was a term that kind of came from porcelain veneers when we were, in fact, tacking them in place. But we're tacking these crowns in place, too. Yes, uh, light curing units will um, be able to penetrate th all the way through uh, zirconia oxide, just like they do lithium disilicate and any other all ceramic restoration. So we're going to cure it just to the point where we can clean it up easily. We don't want to make it rock hard where we would have to use a burr, but kind of like that first time, we don't want it to be really soft either where it's still mushy. We just want to get it to the point where we can clean it off with an explorer, go interproximally with a floss, put a little knot in there, make sure we get all the cement out interproximally, and then uh, go through with our light curing unit and do the finishing cure on that. And here's the patient smiling with the Bruxer anterior restorations on seven, eight, and nine. Uh, thankfully, none of the preps are showing through. And we've been able to, if we keep it wet and we keep saliva in those black triangles now, um, the surface tension will hold the saliva in there and so you won't see those black triangles. And the teeth are always wet. I mean, there's no time where, unless the patient carries compressed air with them, where they would blow out their black triangles and smile at someone at a party. So you can see we still had a little one in the distal in number nine. There was one between six and seven as well. But just a huge difference from those PFMs that were over on the left compared to the Bruxer anterior on the right. And always make sure you manage the patient expectations. So when they when she comes in with those PFMs you see on the left with those black triangles because there's no papilla there, you know, you really need to manage that and say we can probably make those smaller, but I don't think we can eliminate those completely because the reason we have those black triangles is only partly because of the crowns, um, but the major part of it has to do with your own gum tissue and some periodontal disease that it appears that you've had uh, in the past. And so if you manage those expectations and you keep those black triangles small enough, when the patient has saliva in and around those teeth, which is pretty much going to be any time you're not working on them, if those black triangles are small enough, the surface tension of the saliva will uh, hold itself in place and help to fill those. All, the whole point is you just don't want to be able to see through them into the space in the back of the patient's mouth. So going from PFMs to Bruxer anterior here was a huge aesthetic improvement for the patient, and uh, I was happy with the result as well.